What's up everybody, it's Taylor Lee for Congress here and we've got another excellent video for you, a masterclass in storytelling and we're going to do a case study on Halo and Halo 2. The opening scene gives a sense of scale. Halo is known for being a large universe and Halo dwarfs anything mankind has built. We're going to be in for a crazy ride. Ease isn't the most prominent character in this game, is designed to introduce both him and Cortana as people and we're stepping into their world. They weren't designed for us, they already existed and we're just watching. Here, Cortana lays it out for us. The odds are overwhelming, and Keys lays it back at her. We're not giving up, no matter what. Well, that's it then. Bring the ship back up to combat alert alpha. I want everyone at their station. Everyone, sir? The emphasis on everyone here is foreshadowing you, the player. It's a mainstay of storytelling to take advantage of the medium you're using. The strength of video games as a medium is that you can tell the different stories with different difficulties. Sergeant Johnson's lines here don't particularly add to the story, but they show different levels of his character, and this difficulty-based differentiation is a staple in Halo scenes. This is one of my favorite Johnson lines. Johnson's slow approach here serves to differentiate him from the rank-and-file marines you will be serving with later. His line about greenhorns is directed at you, the player, not really the other marines. Quote-unquote hushed casket is cryptic language for Master Chief. This type of linguistic flexing is common in military speak and serves to flesh out the universe despite never being used again in the franchise to my knowledge. This could be because code language is often used once and disposed of for security reasons, or it could be coincidence. Either way, the people who wrote Halo went to great lengths to employ every little strength of the video game medium to tell you their story. If they didn't, this wouldn't be a masterclass. This entire tutorial section fleshes out the universe while you explore it. This is a core strength of video game story. It's like being in the movie while you watch the movie. This pause by Cortana is great. She calmly calculates an additional kill while against overwhelming odds. This is part of her character, being a thinking machine capable of, but not biased towards emotion. Most people would be jumping in their seats at that accomplishment. A little banter between these two is a great introduction to Chief, and it prefaces the rest of the game we will spend with these two. This line is silly because we never hear about the antimatter charges ever again. That's okay though, even masters make mistakes, especially when they don't know a story is going to become an entire universe. That's because when Bungie made Halo, it was kind of meant to be a one-off. They didn't realize it would be so popular. This series of orders from Keys gives a clear and natural meal of exposition. A lot of exposition in Halo feels natural. More on this later. The fact that you walk around the game and find failed emergency evacuation vehicles and dead marines speaks a lot to the strength of video game storytelling. This isn't all though. Jen Taylor recorded lines for finding these gems. They feed the story in an optional way, which also means everyone who plays the game walks away with a slightly different story, though not usually less compelling because of this. The Covenant also have cryptic name schemes, but instead of being spiritual or security based like humans, their naming conventions are highly zealous interpretations of their religion and they ostensibly inherit this from the Forerunners who implemented similarly significant naming conventions, even if it was for different religious purposes. Wow. This music is alien and wonderful, and highlights the beauty of humanity's deadly foe. Music is a strength of storytelling in video games and video. Master Chief going last here signifies he weighs more and can also symbolize his willingness to stay behind. Sometimes with story, there are multiple interpretations, and they aren't all necessarily wrong. If I'm analyzing this correctly, they believe that Halo is some kind of weapon, one with vast, unimaginable... Nobody talks about this, but in all following Halos, the Covenant don't refer to Halos as a weapon. It's just a source of divine wind to set the great journey upon us. It's possible these early interpretations of Halo by the Covenant did believe it was a weapon, and later on this fact was redacted and replaced with a religious idea. 
It's also possible that neither is mutually exclusive. Perhaps the prophets see Halo in the same way you might see the Christian sense of rapture. If you were to use the rapture as a weapon. Eurasian religion is heavily symbolized in Halo, and one thing common in storytelling is building on the stories of others. Just like this game brought you and your friends as kids together, building your stories as people. This scene symbolizes Key's strengths as a pilot, and his resourcefulness as a warrior. Everything is a weapon. This beach landing scene is badass and transitions seamlessly into gameplay for a fan favorite level. The dead marines you find around might be an indication of the UNSC attempting to soften early resistance on the island for Chief. This gets back into what we were talking about earlier. When you're exploring a world, you can find tidbits that are not advertised to you, they're not fed to you on a spoon, like they are in a movie or perhaps a book. Video games are unique in the sense that you can find things optionally to flesh out the story. And you still get a full story if you don't find these things. Another scene displaying the epic disparity in scale between man and the cosmos. Using analogies here like honeycomb are a staple in stories that are heard or read, so the audience can picture the scene. This honeycomb is evident in the Warthog run of Halo 3 where we can see the inside of the ring without terrain on top. You wouldn't know this unless you were deep into the Halo lore, but the pelican is about the same length as a C-130 with half the wingspan. With this in mind though, Forehammer's comments about turning on a dime is easy to empathize with. This shot of the pelican going underground with the door closing above is amazing. It's never explained how the door knows to open for us, but from context clues earlier in the game, we can assume Cortana gained access codes. Imagine you're at the bottom of a brutal caste system and nobody takes you seriously. You then tell your commander that the enemy is airdropping underground. This is why this grunt is so terrified outside of Raw Surprise, and it's hilarious. Bungie is known for their highbrow humor. This ring isn't a cudgel, you barbarian. It's something else. Something this is banter, but it's important. also serious. The Covenant were right. This ring... Knowing everything we know, it's hard to see Master Chief confused here. Not knowing what we know, it's hard to follow Cortana. <clears throat> it's a mark of excellent storytelling to write two characters in a scene with different understandings and keep them consistently at odds until the characters are on the same page. This is especially true if both characters are written by the same person simultaneously. This foreshadowing is really heavy-handed and it's likely that Cortana knew what the threat was. It's also possible she didn't. She as she was processing so much knowledge at once and verifying the danger she was seeing in Halo's data. And I'm just now realizing how much buildup in CE we get before the Flood. The best stories are the ones you don't realize you're being told. This radio is optional foreshadowing. These guns shooting and the elevator moving on its own afterward really give a sense of events outside the player character happening. It gives you that same lurking feeling you get when a door closes in an empty house. But there aren't ghosts in Halo, pun intended. And we know that. And we know that. This makes the elevator moving on its own even more creepy because we know it's meant to be ominous and creepy, but the story doesn't build up to the things we normally expect. There is no serial killers here, no ghosts or vampires, just terrified aliens and evidence of marines. It's creepy because we don't know what's happening, and it's scary because everything our brain says it might be, we know it can't be, deepening the unknown.
This dead marine is clearly a waste of flesh. His existence as potential but unconsumed food sheds light on a deeper intelligence of the Flood. I don't think this part was written for this reason, but it makes you ponder the horror of the Flood on replays. Horror relies on shock, which wears off quickly. But cosmic horror, that horror about the lingering unknown, the unsolvable, is a fear that grips you as time goes on. It doesn't wear off until well after the first shock, and the Flood is one of the greatest cosmic horror presences of all time. Halo CE is the best game in the franchise for fleshing out the horror of the Flood, and although terminals in later games and movies like the Mona Lisa do well to capture this horror, none of them really capture the fear like that first visceral experience. Before you know how dangerous the Flood is, before you know anything about its cosmic intent, its ravenous hunger, you know only the overwhelming numbers and aggressive behavior of this new enemy. Little conflicts like this flesh out the world a little more. They give us a connection and a frame of reference for the Marines who are presumed MIA. Usually, horror has a strong impact the more time you spend with a character before something bad happens to them. One weakness of video game storytelling is that you have to balance story with gameplay. Too much time bonding with Johnson and Vicente here, and the player will get bored. The compromise is this fun and relatable banter. Quirks in the audio like this appalling ripping sound add atmosphere and can imply corruption of video, which can imply other things. This recording going over the area we just went through gives us an eerie sense that we are following in the footsteps of missing people, building the anticipation for what happened to them. In stories about serial killers, this trend can lead to a climax. Here, it's just a small hump in our journey to a much bigger climax. This friend of yours comment is fun, so it accomplishes its goal of directing you, the viewer, away from the obvious question of what happened. This is a matter of pacing. It's also to help with buildup. It's a really abrasive transition if you're looking for it, but a really smooth one if this is showing us where that crazy marine who shot at us earlier came from, and we're about to find out why he shot us. This is a more intense form of anticipation building. The way Halo increases intensity of foreshadowing and anticipation, the closer to the big reveal we get is masterful. This is a nice little touch, and I wonder how many people caught it over the years. The recording ends abruptly and has a question mark after the KIA. That's ominous when you know what you know about the Flood. This number is a date and time, in case you needed to know. Chief throwing the chip away here is him showing disgust without words. We're being shown how he feels, not told. Even under a thousand pounds of titanium armor, we feel what he feels. Being told this is Installation 04 implies strongly that there are or were other rings. And we find out later that there are other rings, and though we're busy playing the game, if you spend eight hours a day away from the game and at school like I did, it makes your head swim with questions about the universe. It's this mystery that keeps us coming back to the big universes we love, whether it's Halo, Dead Space, or Star Wars. Fohammer's terrified words here usually go unnoticed, but imagine being in her shoes. If she picks up any Marines, she might end up like the pilot in Aliens, and your hero signal just vanished. 343 Guilty Spark is absolutely guilty of something. Info dumps and exposition. However, He's quirky and delivers exposition in a consistent way, and he often speaks on things as if you already know them. To him, he's just making idle small talk, so the exposition doesn't feel like exposition, but it still tells us about what is going on, so we don't lose hope while we're plowing through the library. I think the choreography of CE Anniversary is inferior to the original for this scene. This version of the scene feels a little rushed. This is another example of making exposition feel natural. The end of the previous scene and the beginning of this one do not have matching dialogue. This means Spark was talking to Chief during teleportation, and we only catch the last bit of what he was saying. This means Bungie could have given us more exposition, but cut the beginning of the exposition for scene development. Usually this cutting happens at the last half of dialogue, when someone gets interrupted by an explosion, for example. Neither is better, but the use of the less common strategies demonstrates the degree of talent employed by Bungie at the time. Another way of making exposition feel natural is with pointless exposition. What I mean is exposition you don't care about, but it has relevance to the characters. Nobody cares that it took Master Chief 12 hours to get to and go through the previous two levels, but subconsciously, we know the information is important to them. Nobody likes to be cooped up for 12 hours. Nobody likes to fight through the library for 12 hours. You don't care because it didn't take you 12 hours, but you do know these characters care, and that adds weight to what Cortana says next. Master Chief's single-mindedness shines here. All that matters is winning. 
Sparks' single-mindedness also shines here. All that matters is stopping the Flood. He's so matter-of-fact that he doesn't even consider that Master Chief might be ignorant to the Flood. Spark has a privilege of knowledge that Master Chief doesn't have. And that privilege is so entrenched in Spark that he says the following line, But you already knew that. Spark's last line, I mean, how couldn't you, gets into some really scary cosmic horror possibilities. In Halo Reach, Dr. Halsey says that some knowledge is a birthright to mankind from an ancient civilization. Of course, Halo CE precedes all the books in Halo Reach, the game, but the writers had intended on this trajectory, that mankind was once great and was guaranteed greatness again by an ancient civilization. <clears throat> the cosmic horror part here is that civilization's plan failed and that torch never reached us. We completely missed all opportunities to develop from that birthright. Now we're rediscovering the bad without the benefit of the good. Our fates are in the hands of great beings who made mistakes, but meant well. It's kind of like if you grew up in Appalachia. Chances are your family works in the coal mines. The analogy here is that you get to go work in the coal mines and get lung cancer, but you never get the gas mask that your grandfather invented to prevent harm to your lungs. The back and forth between Cortana and Spark to Chief is designed to build tension here. I've heard all kinds of conspiracy theories about who Spark is referencing here when he says, last time you asked me, everything from he's quite literally insane to some ancient human is living in Chief's body. That last one feels too supernatural and contrived for me. It's entirely possible that this dialogue meant something that was retconned later and now serves no direct purpose to the story. However, it's possible that Spark has thought long and hard on this for eons and now, being deprived of the ones who asked him this originally is an accurate speech on Chief. Spark wants closure. We've all said something stupid and gone through things and relived them awkwardly in our heads for years, never getting the chance to say that back. Imagine how Spark feels. He feels human. Little moments like this are like marshmallows in your cereal. They keep you hungry for more. No human life signs detected. The captain, he's one of them. We can't let the flood get off this ring. You know what he'd expect. We didn't bond with Keys much, but we can still feel the weight of this decision for Chief from his hesitance and from Cortana's somber and anxious words. I always like to pretend these shots of the Banshee are why the Banshee is falling apart in the next scene. The Gregorian chant here gives a strong sense of awe and sobriety. This proud, well-built ship is now lying derelict. She only has one action left to offer man. Certainly a ship like this would have an archive of most internet material that would be relevant to the crew's professional and leisurely activities, so showing Spark using this to catch up on lost time makes perfect sense. It's our turn to give him exposition. Spark is showing us an obsession with knowledge here, much like Cortana did earlier. And as she acts more human with us, Spark is acting less human. The characters softly switched roles earlier when Spark replaced Cortana. But from the two betrayals onward, Cortana is pushing Spark out of the picture and giving us our sole human experience to share the story with. Simultaneously, Spark acts more like a machine, talking about saving the head, disposing of the rest, enjoying categorization of knowledge, etc. Cortana, on the other hand, is completely emotionally engaged with Chief and Foehammer. You can tell this with her tone of voice. She engages in a full spectrum of emotions with these two characters, including anger at the third character, which is Guilty Spark. Meanwhile, Guilty Spark is fairly monotone in his emotion. It's just excitement. It's just excitement about knowledge, which is pretty mechanical. But of course, here we go is completely un is a completely unnecessary line. For the robotic and stoic Master Chief, this seems like an oversight upon his inspection. What it actually does is show us some humanity in Chief. The stakes are high. The Flood, the Halo, his own life, and of course Cortana's existence are all at an intersection right now. Even though the toughest warriors feel stress, this small break from character is Chief succumbing to this stress. Come here, you mother. I'm gonna 
This legendary exclusive cutscene is there as a treat to keep you playing the game, but it can also provide comic relief. Breaks for intense stories are essential, and comic relief is one popular and effective way of giving the audience a break from non-stop action. Scanning. Now that the mission has been accomplished, Master Chief must immediately fill the void and give himself another mission, looking for survivors. We did what we had this final line is iconic, thematic, and memorable. Quotes like this are awesome because the they can create callback scenes between no two characters who share a moment who shared a moment previously and can enrich those interactions. I think we see a callback to this at the end of Halo 3, and that gives us a deeper sense of accomplishment. We thought we had finished the fight. <sighs> okay, I'm excited for this. Halo 2 is iconic, and it's rare to see someone one-up themselves so fantastically as Bungie did with Halo 2. Pause the video and go grab a fat snack because this plot is thick. Uh, okay, I, I will try not to make bad puns like that anymore. <laughs> this is really neat. We're getting shown the other side of the story. We get verification that Cortana was right about Halo's religious significance to the Covenant, and we see how much further the Covenant take this. I like all the jeers the soon-to-be Arbiter gets. It makes me think of a congressional hearing on something important, and half those present are saying it doesn't exist. Also, if you listen carefully, Bungie went to the extraordinary lengths of including actual dialogue in these jeers. The scene of this explosion has never been consistent with the actual ending of Halo. I think it's because this is the Covenant's telling of the story, and the destruction of the ring is obvious, but a giant explosion causing it is too painful to relive. It could be lazy scene choreography, but this is Bungie, and the actual scene could be copied and pasted, but it wasn't. Something tells me this was intentional. Tartarus laughing right here gives you all the subtext you need, even though you don't know you need it. He likes when the High Council is in conflict. He likes when the Covenant leadership are hungry for the blood of their own. I love this line and its delivery is perfect for the scene and story. At an Inquisition near you. Nay, it was heresy! Arbiter pulling away like this shows his frustration with the situation and perhaps a healthy racism towards the brutes. Also, he isn't Arbiter yet, but I'm going to call him Arbiter because that is going to keep things simple. This is an interesting little detail. These first elites turn their head to follow Arbiter. Imagine losing your rank and privilege and all your honor, and the guards who used to be below you are watching you walk past them. Chief's reintroduction and new armor are iconic. Because Halo 2 had greater ambition behind it, and larger audience to appease, there was room for more main characters. Banter is one of Bungie's favorite ways of introducing new characters. 343 Studios tried to emulate this with Commander Sarah Palmer and Halo 4's infamous I Thought You'd Be Taller line, but it fell flat, and it wasn't genuine, it wasn't natural. But most importantly, it just wasn't crafted by the same people. When a person or a crew put together their craft, the craft takes on a personality. Which is why the core Halo games feel connected and related, but why Bungie's Destiny and 343's Halos all feel like separate universes from the original Halos. They're made by different groups of people, so the collected spirit that built those games is different. Anyway, this banter reintroduces Sergeant Major Johnson and lets us know he is here to stay. An optimistic human badass for us to connect with outside of the Master Chief, who is laconic in his speech and can feel emotionally mechanical. If you remember back to Halo 1, we do see Johnson ostensibly get killed by the Flood. This scene also offers that there's a deeper lore behind why he survived. And that's an excellent point in storytelling as well. There's the the story creators are letting us know that there is an explanation for Johnson surviving that. But Johnson gives us a little bit of dialogue and some exposition saying he can't tell us why. Now ordinarily this would be lazy writing. It's very easy to say, oh, I'm just alive because well can't tell you why, because it's a secret. But if you dig deeper in the Halo lore, there is an explanation. Not only is there an explanation, but <laughs> that explanation is said to be um, falsified information to cover up the real information. 
So when you get into the books, this is fully fleshed out and explained. Um, but I don't think it's lazy writing to exclude that true explanation in the game itself. Things like that are a strength of kind of a more meta way of storytelling, which is with novelization, video, and video games. Mirroring is a technique in storytelling where you tell two different stories, realities, characters, or experiences with one another. <clears throat> Often there are similarities and contrasts. Here the similarities are that Chief and Arbiter are being ceremonialized simultaneously for the same event. The contrasts are that one is being rewarded and the other punished. The execution here is flawless. Imagine that deep bellowing as you're being marched to your spiritual execution and the lowest members of your society are all united in speaking freely ill of you. Foreshadowing here. But it's a video game. You knew the action would come eventually. This just gives you a plausible introduction to the conflict while still feeling natural and not rushed. Cortana is actually talking to a random marine in the background coming back from Libo wearing an I Love Bees t-shirt. These mirrored scenes are themed appropriately. Cairo Station is well lit, the scenes are close up, the uniforms are white, it feels warm, and the speech is calm and dignified. This is appropriate for an award ceremony. High Charity, on the other hand, is dark. Many of the scenes are from a distance, and the speech is loud and energetic. This is appropriate for a punishment. And it's important to note here <clears throat> that the warm and the coolness, the low energy and the high energy are not necessarily exclusive to positive or negative experiences. It's the combination of those things that lead to the delivery of a positive or a negative. I just want to nerd out here for a minute. When Cortana says the enemy is outside the range of the Mac, she doesn't mean in the conventional sense. In space, projectiles will continue to go as long as there's no gravity or atmosphere to slow them down. The kill zone here is most likely the distance at which it would take so long for the Mac to hit a Covenant capital ship that the target could detect and move out of the way of the cannon. Just a, a nerd moment, don't mind me. Yes, sir. I need a weapon. Ugh, everything Chief says in Halo 2 is pure sex. I need a towel. This is implying the bomb didn't have much time, but really it's an easy line to use here as the writers also didn't know how much time was left on the bomb. If this was a larger or more significant part of the story, this would be lazy writing. But for something small and insignificant like this, how much time was left on the bomb doesn't really matter because the bomb never goes off and nothing changes no matter how much time was left on it. I love how Lord Hood is just casually doing work and the Master Chief makes the absurd suggestion of giving the Covenant back their bomb. He looks up, wonders, and then greenlights Chief's request, but he still looks confused. This is an established strategist, and he isn't fully prepared for the Chief's audacity. But he's so shocked he doesn't question it. 343 got a lot wrong, but most of the videography and choreography of Halo 2 Anniversary is really detailed, and I think they nailed the story intent Bungie was going for, including the body language of Halo 2's characters. It's at about this moment that Lord Hood realized exactly what Chief wants to do, or that Cortana communicates the same. And we know this from these long swords seemingly unprompted bombing a hole in a covenant hole directly in Chief's path. This Marine says this because she knows we tried or will try to kill it with rockets before the scripted scene. If you look carefully, Sergeant Johnson becomes an NPC for a split second here. More excellent body language. You just know this man is afraid, but apparently more afraid of Johnson than the covenant. This is another section where we're given a different scene for each difficulty, and each line is stellar with fiery delivery. It's perfection. Commander Miranda Keys has attempted several times to send her frigate against larger Covenant ships. She always asks and always wants to attack the bigger ships. It's clear but subtle that Commander Keys wants to make her father proud. She knows the size of his shoes and wants desperately to fill them. But discipline tempers this desire, so while we see her raw ambition, we also see Keys asking questions and doing research. She's always trying to learn, even if she probably feels impatient about it. I guarantee if the stakes weren't so high, Keys would find herself in private with Lord Hood berating her for being too aggressive with the resources at her disposal against a superior force.
if you listen carefully, you can hear the Gravemind whispering propaganda to you in the soundtrack. Maybe it's not the Gravemind, maybe it's somebody else. But the point is, it's propaganda gently and subtly interlaced into the music, and it fits the tempo so smoothly that it's hard to notice at first listen. The Prophet of Truth interrupting Tartarus with another command that reaffirms the original command is Truth telling Tartarus that it's okay to leave Arbiter alone with them. The intent of the interruption could indicate contempt towards Tartarus, or more likely, is just a raw exercise of authority. Truth interrupts Tartarus because he doesn't need to be respectful. It also shows how deeply indoctrinated, though we don't know this yet, the elites are. The prophets understand Arbiter's shame is so deep he isn't emotionally strong enough to be a threat to anybody. You know where we are. The mausoleum. This is a rhetorical question. Elites are zealous to their proud heritage, and so all elites should know about the mausoleum of the Arbiter. This question could be contemptuous to Arbiter, intended to remind Arbiter of his shame, and it also serves to set the scene for us, the audience, who have no idea what is going on. Truth words here are carefully chosen. Created and consumed. Not used, not lionized, not deployed. Consumed. When we are the Arbiter, we are a product, a tool, nothing more. And this is an excellent fate for someone who's so full of shame. Truth is showing a tremendous empathy and forgivingness here. The delivery is perfect, though we later learn Truth is a master manipulator, which makes the convincing facade all the more believable. The heretic leader is cut off deliberately before he can directly sacrilege the great journey in front of Arbiter, who might, but probably won't meditate on what the heretic has to say. Prophet Mercy seems to always say something after Truth. It adds depth to the religious and cultural rhetoric of Truth. There are more than one entity telling us these things. These layers add validity to what we're being told, and it doesn't come off as desperate, so we can probably conclude that Mercy is content with his place and doesn't feel threatened by or competitive with Truth, who is the leader of the Triumvirate, that is to say, the Three Prophets. The delivery pod for Arbiter's armor is Yonic in appearance. Similar to the grand entrances of the Derelict in Alien, this is likely to symbolize birth, creation, or rise. It could be entirely coincidental, but Halo is rich in symbolism, so just know that the symbolism of birth is probable here. This is more exposition. Arbiter's question is likely genuine. He is worried what the Council will think, and Mercy is reminding him what being an Arbiter means. It's also exposition for us, but feels natural for the aforementioned reasons. The elites are a martial society. They are exposed to pain from childhood. Arbiter isn't covering his scar because it hurts his flesh. He's covering it because he's ashamed. Think of a pedophile having such a tattoo. Even if everybody knows, they still don't want it to be seen. The temporary euphoria of being given purpose again is elevating Arbiter from his depression. What would you have your Arbiter do? These grunts messing with one another is totally unnecessary, but it provides comic relief and shows us that the grunts, who are not reciting religious speeches with the elites, behave in a different social class than the elites. This little detail fleshes out the world just a little bit more. You don't play a Halo story. You breathe it. See what I did there? Because the methane and the grunts touching the breathing harness? Yeah, okay, okay. This is a compliment and an insult. We don't get a ton of deep cultural development with the elites, but they seem to give insults with respect simultaneously. See also the term demon for Master Chief. Arbiter makes eye contact to acknowledge, but looks down. This could be submission in the discussion, or merely an acknowledgement of what both elites know led to the Arbiter being where he is. Mentioning the storm now seems inconsequential, but makes arrival later on immersive, because we literally have a forecast of the event. What is it? That stench. I've smelled it before. The music here when Halfjaw speaks lets us know, if we have played the original Halo, that he smells flood. Also, smelling the flood would likely conjure memories burned into his mind. The scene always confused me because Arbiter would also smell what Halfjaw smelled. In reality, Halfjaw smelled it before Arbiter did, making the interaction necessary for the story, though this is a, a weak justification for the scene, because the scene doesn't actually develop anything that isn't developed elsewhere. Though, it is some time when Arbiter and Hafjar are communicating, so it could, for some people, signify relationship development between the two. This Banshee shooting the other Banshee justifies the Arbiter crashing in the next scene, 
which serves as a callback to the previous game. Arbiter even climbs up like Chief did at the beginning of the last level of Halo. Knowing what we know now, drawing on the Arbiter was foolish. But if we put ourselves in the heretic's boots, we can sort of figure out why he does this. Me personally, I would let 343 tell Arbiter everything and recruit Arbiter to my cause. However, that storm is closing in and we're surrounded by flood. Also, the chance of Arbiter converting to my views might be low. And if I can kill Arbiter, the right hand of the lying prophets, I would develop a significant reputation which would help me in my cause. We also need to know that behind the scenes, Arbiter probably reflects on the heretic and his words and actions often, helping him cooperate with the humans later, so in a way, the heretic did accomplish his goal, just probably not how he wanted to. Tartarus' nonchalance about his treatment of the Oracle could indicate a disregard for the Covenant religion, but we see his loyalty to the religion later. So what this is showing us is that the brutes are, well, they're brutes. Their loyalty manifests as barbaric and rough-handed, it's much more a reflection of their animalistic nature versus the elites who are regal, martial, but disciplined and honorful. Cortana answering for Chief is to remind the other humans that she exists. And Chief doesn't correct her because he doesn't need to. She isn't wrong, and there's nothing else to elaborate on. Johnson's reaction didn't reflect mine when I first played Halo 2. But if you took the full conflict of destroying Halo from CE, you will understand Johnson's shock. He, above all, Bar Chief, knows how dangerous this is. Commander Keyes says she thinks this is supposed to be a super weapon, tells us she isn't particularly impressed with Halo. Seeing Chief looking at a display of Halo shows us that he is aware of it, but unfortunately we don't get any other input from him. Bungie could have put a heart rate monitor there by him and it's calm up until now, and his heartbeat is elevated during this scene. It would show us what we already assume, he's stressed, but managing it quite well because he's a Spartan. This is one of my favorite cutscenes in Halo 2. It's so full of action, but not a ton of conflict. It's like we're on Halo again, but this time it's a little more on our terms. This scene sets up some conflict for the following levels. We're going to stop another Halo. Cortana obeyed the orders to give Commander Keys all information she had, and the glorious library is going to be a factor again. The scale of ships coming into view with Cortana's comments set the scene up for the stakes here. I love the sound design on this Covenant ship charging up its glassing beam. <clears throat> it reminds me of the new Godzilla charging up and I can listen to both of them all day. Next up, I'll be creating a channel for violence ASMR. The scene is beautiful, but Bungie's version is better. Like, we know the plasma is going to get close to Chief. You didn't have to show us this dumb hand of plasma chasing Chief. Oh, gonna get you! Almost got you! I could go faster, but I'm holding back because you have plot armor! The plasma in this scene from Bungie's Halo 2 moved faster but started later, so Chief's escape looks natural, not scripted. What was that?! This entire scene is designed to show the savagery of the brutes, the stress of replacement to the elites, and it has some hints of truth liking the end of Prophet Regret. This entire scene is dark, but light is shown on Tartarus and Arbiter, highlighting their roles in the scene. These elites need this combat to take their minds off the recommissioning of the Guard. And I guarantee you, Truth is taking full advantage. I think he means the Parasite is not to be truffled with. Tartarus' words here serve to try and divide Arbiter from Halfjaw, and make Arbiter trust Tartarus more. This trust is enriched by the fact that Tartarus follows his word and provides covering fire during this section. This scene changing from what seems to be a flood tentacle in the original to a steel cable in Anniversary is a crime. The derelict state of the Index Containment Chamber shows us things have gone to shit compared to the first Halo's library. This is subtext and world building all in one. It hints that something else has been in control here, aside from a competent monitor. Commander Keys having only one SMG in this scene instead of two is a crime. And the prophets learn of this, that they will take your head. You can hear genuine desperation in Arbiter's voice. 
I think it's the shock of the sudden betrayal and Tartarus's calm demeanor in sentencing Arbiter to death that catches the Arbiter off guard. He just risked everything for several missions for the Prophets, and now he is being discarded by their wishes. The weight of being consumed is now self-evident. Arbiter's wide eyes reveal he knows he has no friends here, or in control of Tartarus. I'm really disappointed I wasn't afforded the opportunity to play another library mission. This game will be almost unplayable from henceforth. The remake of this hallway scene is terrifying. This scene implies that Gravemind can hear Cortana inside Chief's helmet, or that Cortana asked the question with open comms, inviting Gravemind to respond. Gravemind says, I shall talk, and immediately Penitent Tanshin and the Prophet of Regret begin speaking. Gravemind was not misspeaking. He is THE representative of the Flood, and if the Flood uses the term I, it actually means we. The Flood only sees plurality in its enemies. It sees itself as a single unifying force. This scene doesn't show us this, but it communicates it in a subtle detail. Remember, it is a height of storytelling skill to make a character speak how they feel and do so consistently to the smallest detail like this conversation. Regret's comment here indicates that the prophets are so deeply entrenched in their beliefs that they won't even believe their own religious items. This one's contained. Gravemind shuddering here shows us how he feels about the idea of being contained. Save your prophets. Regret's screams here are a really nice horrific touch. This is a layer of horror. I like to think that Gravemind assimilated Regret, but let him think he wasn't assimilated so he would explain his views. The screams are Gravemind letting all the information of reality go back to Regret's mind before going back to assimilating all of the information in his mind. If you want to know more about what happens in the mind when infected by the Flood, I suggest reading Halo the Flood by William C. Dietz. It's gospel, and I don't care what any of you tell me. And no, the irony of my unwillingness to listen to others about Halo lore while discussing the same character flaw in the Prophets is not lost on me. I love how Truth looks at Mercy like, did you see that? The audacity! What 343 did to Cortana's face here and in Halo 4 and 5 are all crimes. If Commander Key's scenes were misdemeanors, this is a felony. This scene shows us that Tartarus is a competent military leader and strategist, which is important for the finale. Halo Infinite will be a love letter to Halo, CE. My faith is strong. If you look carefully, Mercy is tapping a button in panic. He wouldn't do this for no reason, and we know those thrones come with guns. This scene might be trying to tell us that his cannons were malfunctioning, or... They were sabotaged. And look at the look in Truth's eyes when he says the great journey awaits no one. What's even scarier about this is that in the next scene, Chief asks Mercy what's going on, and Mercy shows complete contempt to Chief, and loyalty to the Covenant's cause. This is really subtle and niche, and probably coincidental, but Mercy's facial expressions are so similar to a baby rabbit crying for help. Either someone drew this from their mind, or really wanted to make Mercy look helpless. Baby rabbits are deaf, blind, and practically sessile. Notice that only Key's phantom arrived, and Tartarus looks over his shoulder and snarls. This is really subtle subtext that Johnson got away. Here is one of the few examples of Cortana being wrong. She says the grave mind always intended to get to in amber clad, and that we were just a diversion. Firstly, how could we be a diversion? A key to strong storytelling is that you don't explain every little thing to the audience. The problem with this is when your audience is an idiot like me, you may not communicate the full story to me, leaving room to speculate and get it wrong. I believe Cortana means here that Chief's presence in the Inner Sanctum would rattle the Prophet so thoroughly, especially after just starting a civil war against the elites because they are incompetent, that High Charity would be flustered and not expecting an attack from the Flood, Where is he going? and that attack would come from Inamor Clad. The problem I have with this, or any theory I can come up with, is that the Grave Mind says we will search in one likely place and Arbiter will search in another. The scary bit is that the Index was at both places. Grave Mind was telling the truth. Now, did Grave Mind plan include ruffling High Charity's feathers and making In Amber Clad's attack easier? That's entirely possible, but I don't think we were being manipulated just to that end. This has always bothered me. I can never tell what this guy is saying and the subtitles don't help. 
But while making this video, I read that Halfjaw is who negotiated a peace between humans and elites, so he could be telling Arbiter that at this time. This is just Bungie rubbing in your face that Johnson broke out of a phantom full of brutes and commandeered a scarab by himself, and you will not get a Johnson campaign. Ha ha ha! Arbiter asking Spark what Halo's purpose is him accepting what Chief and Gravemind told him. The music for these few seconds feels light and warm. This is showing us Arbiter's character arc has peaked and he is accepting his new reality and ironically it's the prophets who allowed this to happen. The warm moment is ruined by Tartarus which gives the opportunity for Johnson to be introduced in this scene standing at Arbiter's side. For us and Tartarus to see that the elites and humans who have been fighting for almost half a century are united against the brutes. Tartarus isn't mad because his faith is challenged, he's mad because big words. <clears throat> I'm, I'm actually serious here. Remember, Tartarus has strong faith, so strong that he won't easily give it up, even if it is strategically wise to do so. And remember, he's a good strategist. If Spark used smaller words and simpler phrasing, or if Tartarus could comprehend literature above a 10th grade level, this scene might play out differently. But we are being shown how the Prophets benefited from switching their guard to a blinder, dumber species than the Elites. Perhaps Spark told them some things that made the Prophets uncomfortable. And having seen the first heretic and how quickly he gathered support, the Prophets were gravely concerned about their power. This goes double when we read Halo Contact Harvest, where we learn that the Forerunner word for humans is Reclaimer. And this concept meant that the Forerunners left their designs to humanity which directly challenges the Covenant beliefs, so they tried to wipe us out on Harvest, not knowing that that was only a far-flung colony. <clears throat> anyway, having that context shows us in Halo 2 that there are complex and shifting political powers and motives colliding here, and we get to see it all unfold. Tartarus very specifically says the Brutes, not the Elites, will be the Prophet's escorts. This is showing us that because Tartarus didn't fully understand Spark, he assumed it was some sort of facade to undermine brute power and put the elites back at the forefront of Covenant political power. Driven by ambition and newfound respect, Tartarus is unwilling to give up his species' position because he misunderstood the intent of what he was being told. This scene lingers on to make us wonder if the ring actually fired and if this entire story was all for naught. Arbiter casually walking between the humans that he fought earlier puts him in a vulnerable position of being flanked. He is showing great trust here for his new allies, and him asking a follow-on question to Key's line of questioning shows the audience that his priorities are now in line with the humans. Chief's story ends symbolically where it began in this game, answering a question to Lord Hood, who once again is surprised at the audacity. This concludes my master class and case study on Halo and Halo 2 storytelling. If you like it, let me know. We might cover Halo 3 later on. But I'm not going to cover Halo 3 right now because this video is already long enough and most of the things that happen in Halo 3 as far as storytelling case study material are already covered in Halo CE and Halo 2. Storytelling can be really complicated, but most people can understand it pretty easily because we're all wired to be story learners. When, when you get together with your family or when you go to school. The most effective way of teaching somebody something is to put it in a story or to put it in their hands. And when you play a video game, you're getting both. You're playing the game and you're living in the experience. You get that tunnel vision and you're just staring at your television or your PC and everything else just kind of fades out and you're immersed it's like you're living in that world, and that's the strength of telling stories with video games. And Bungie had a really compelling story to tell, and they expanded on it, and it was profitable, so other people expanded on it even more. And we get some retconning and typical stuff like what happened with Star Wars and other franchises. It's pretty common at this point, and it's unfortunate, but don't let that deter you from the core storytelling elements. <clears throat> um, uh, maybe I should make a, a categorized list for storytelling because um, the people at Bungie were highly educated and, and really understood how to communicate a story to you. And it's even cooler because 
there's multiple people who wrote the story. It's like reading Harry Potter, except it wasn't J.K. Rowling that wrote Harry Potter. It's kind of more like reading the Bible, where you have dozens of people telling this continuous story. And even um, just the first section, Halo CE, or the second section, Halo 2, there's multiple people, there's multiple people putting their spin on the story. And so you can develop a complex um, and compelling story. If you liked it, um, please don't forget to dislike and unsubscribe and leave a hateful, hateful comment.